The following is a presentation of Tomorrow's World. Sandy Colfax was arguably the best left-handed big league baseball pitcher of all time. But as many older baseball fans know, he was also famous for something he did off the field apart from baseball. The year 1965 had been a banner year for Koufax and the Los Angeles Dodgers, and they were scheduled to play the Minnesota Twins in the World Series. Everyone expected Koufax would start Game 1 for the Dodgers as teams put forward their best pitcher for the opening game. Not only was it important to get off to a good start, but in those days when pitchers worked on a four-day rotation, it meant that their best man could pitch in three of the seven games if the series went to a seventh game. Now, so that I don't lose any of you, you don't have to be a baseball fan to appreciate what I'm going to relate to you today. You don't even have to know anything about the game or sports in general to appreciate what happened on October the 6th, 1965. That was the first day of the World Series and the Dodgers' best pitcher was a no-show. Now, if you'd like to know why and the relevance an event that took place so many decades ago has for you, stay tuned. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where we not only give you the news, but give you the significance behind the news. And today we're going back five decades to a time when one man made history for what he didn't do. To understand what happened on October the 6th, 1965, it is helpful to go back two years to understand this man. In 1963, the Baseball World Series was played between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the New York Yankees. New York had the home run hitting duo of Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris, and an ace pitcher by the name of Whitey Ford. The underdog Dodgers had one of the poorest hitting teams in either league, but they had a great pitching staff led by future Hall of Famers Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. Koufax was chosen to start the series against the great Whitey Ford. To walk into an iconic arena such as Yankee Stadium is enough to unnerve any young player. And when Koufax took the mound in the bottom of the first inning, the hometown Yankee crowd was confident that this young upstart would meet his match. And meet it he did. He only made 12 pitches in that opening inning, but nine were strikes. The following inning, he struck out the first two batters, thus stunning the great New York Yankees by striking out their first five men who came to bat. He went on to strike out a World Series record 15 batters and a complete game 4 to nothing shutout, and the Dodgers went on to win the 1963 World Series in four straight games, Koufax having won two of the four. We now come to the 1965 World Series against the Minnesota Twins. And this time, Koufax would again stun the baseball world, as much for what he did off the field as for what he did on the field. And what he did on the field was pretty impressive. He was scheduled to start the series, and for good reason. If the series went the full seven games, he would be able to pitch in three of them. But there was a problem. The series opener was scheduled for October the 6th, and there are two things that will explain what happened that day. October 6th that year was Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement. And Sandy Koufax was Jewish. And so on October the 6th, 1965, the greatest pitcher of his day refused to pitch. The Day of Atonement is a day that stands alone as the most holy day of the year among Jews. And while Koufax was a secular Jew and would pitch on the weekly Sabbath, he would not on this annual holy day. Why? Why is this day so important to Jews? 
Quoting from Jane Levy, Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement. Those who repent their sins are inscribed in the Book of Life. On October 6, 1965, Koufax was inscribed forever in the Book of Life as the Jew who refused to pitch on Yom Kippur. You might be surprised to know that it's not only Jews who observe this day. Some Christians, including me, were also observing that day back in 1965. It's understandable that you might wonder why. Why would someone who claims the name of Christ observe what most consider to be a Jewish holy day? After all, weren't those days done away at the coming of Christ? On today's program, I'm going to explain why we in the Living Church of God, the sponsor of tomorrow's world, follow the example of Jesus Christ, the apostles, and first century Christianity in observing seven annual biblical holy days, including the Day of Atonement. Church attendance has been dropping in recent decades, and among those who do attend weekly services, only a fraction of them study the Bible. And sadly, among those who do study the Bible, few truly understand it. And that's not totally their fault. What many do not realize is that Christianity as we know it today is not the Christianity of Christ and the Apostles. In fact, it is not even close. As respected historian Jesse Lyman Hurlbut wrote in The Story of the Christian Church, We name the last generation of the first century from 68 to 100 A.D. the Age of Shadows. Partly because the gloom of persecution was over the church, but more especially because of all the periods in the history, it is one about which we know the least. For 50 years after St. Paul's life, a curtain hangs over the church, through which we strive vainly to look. And when at last it rises, about 120 A.D., with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many aspects very different from that in the days of St. Peter and St. Paul. As we can see from this quote, the assault on original Christianity set in early. It's difficult for the average person to comprehend that his or her mainstream minister doesn't believe the Bible. After all, he or she probably quotes from it each week, but whole portions are left out. And worse yet, whole portions are avoided because they do not follow the traditions that have come down to us today that clearly contradict what Jesus and His apostles taught. This cherry-picking of scriptures and doctrines creates a Christian illusion. It portrays what we think of Christianity as Christian when it is not. Further, when confronted with this fact, scriptures are twisted to mean something entirely different from their original intent. For example, if a monument spelling out the Ten Commandments is found on government property today, it will almost certainly be removed but there will be an outcry from professing Christians over its removal. At the same time, if these same people who wish to defend the Ten Commandments are confronted with the need to obey all ten of them, they will be eager to explain that the commandments are done away. Why? Let's look at what many understand as a shortened version of the commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. Now you may have noticed that I left out two of them, the reason for which I'll explain in a moment. But for the most part, these eight of the ten are not controversial. Most people believe we would have a better world without murder, adultery, stealing, and lying. Most parents think it's good for children if they honor their parents. So what's the problem? The first problem, surprisingly, is that there is no agreement on what the ten actually are. Several of the largest denominations combine into one what others define as the first two. They then divide the last commandment into two to come up with the number ten. 
A close examination will explain why. So let me first prove to you what is the 10th commandment. Here it is in Exodus, the 20th chapter, and verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. It should seem obvious that the command is for us not to covet or lust after something that doesn't belong to us. But the majority professing Christian view divides this into the following two commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife as the ninth commandment, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house as the tenth. A complete list of the Ten Commandments is found in two places in the Bible. And by comparing these lists, we can learn God's intent. Let us compare them side by side. First of all, Exodus 20, which says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. But now let's carefully notice the order in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. As you can see, house and wife are reversed. As clever as man is to deceive, God is far more clever to clarify. It should be evident to any neutral observer that the command not to covet is a single command not to covet anything that is your neighbor's his house, his wife, his servants, or his livestock. So one must ask why such an artificial division? Why divide this command into two? The answer is fascinating, and I'll answer this question in a moment. I'll also show you how this is connected to a baseball story five decades ago. But first I want to offer to you one of the most important resources that we've ever offered on this program. The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, brings to life the plan of God in a way that nothing else does. It explains what days Jesus, His Apostles, and first century Christianity observed. Have you ever asked yourself why you observe the days that you do? The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, will amaze you and leave you wondering, why haven't I been told these things by my church? To receive your free copy of The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, all you have to do is call, click, or write, and we'll send it to you absolutely free of charge. Today's offer is yours absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. Call now, 1-800-236-0531. Or write to us at the address on your screen. Or visit us online at tomorrowsworld.org. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. And be sure to go to tomorrowsworld.org forward slash digital. Have a digital subscription sent right to your email inbox faster than postal mail. Visit us online now. Why would some denominations take what is clearly intended to be a single commandment and divide it into two? And why don't all Christian denominations follow suit? Why two different ways of numbering the Ten Commandments? Most people only have a vague idea of what the Ten Commandments actually say. Hardly anyone can name all ten in order. But if they can, it's the abbreviated version. For example, here's the way they begin. I am the Eternal, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. But look what happens when the first two are combined, and only the abbreviated form is given. All that we have left is, 
you shall have no other gods before me. While the first two may appear on the surface to be the same, they're not. By combining what should be two commands, having no other gods before the true God, and don't use images or idols in the worship of God, even the true God, one effectively does away with the command against idols when the shortened version is all that is considered. Now, is it too cynical to ask the question, which denominations combine the first and second and which do not? The iconoclastic controversy, the argument over whether images and idols could be used in Christian worship, raged off and on for centuries. Eventually, the most dominant forms of professing Christianity accepted statues in their worship, while a smaller portion did not. And depending on which side of the controversy a denomination came down on determined how they listed the commandments. The evidence is there for anyone to see that those who use statues in their worship obscure and diminish the second command. But when the second commandment is neutralized, another has to be introduced. Thus, the tenth commandment is artificially divided into two, as we have seen, in order to keep the number at ten. So in my original list of the commandments, I left out the second for reasons just explained. But what about the other one I left out? What does it say? The abbreviated version is found in Exodus 20th chapter, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You see, most people agree with eight of the commandments, but as explained, not everyone accepts the second against using idols. Oddly, those denominations that use idols are greater defenders of the Sabbath command, except that they put a twist on it. They say it's still in effect, but the church changed the day from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Just as strangely, those who don't use idols, for the most part, get around the Sabbath command by claiming the Ten Commandments have been done away. Since they recognize the value of the other nine, they claim the Ten Commandment code is abrogated, and they then resurrect nine of the ten under the banner of the law of Christ. In effect, they do away with ten just to get around one. And while denying the need to keep the Sabbath command, they follow the authority of those who claim with no biblical proof that God gave them the authority to change the day that God sanctified at creation. Or to put it another way, they claim the church knows better than God. But where did the change come from the seventh day to the first day? There are several arguments that supposedly come from the Bible, but they are human justifications and deceptive lies. History tells us precisely how this change came about. Quoting the highly respected Erdman's Handbook to the History of Christianity, when in 321 Constantine made the first day of the week a holiday, he called it the Venerable Day of the Sun, Sunday. When the pagan symbols eventually disappeared, the unconquered sun was the last to go. The entire Bible, from beginning to end, upholds the seventh-day Sabbath. It's an established fact of history that Emperor Constantine chose Sunday, the day he called the Venerable Day of the Sun, as a day of rest, and mainstream Christianity has followed this pagan emperor. Some rely on church authority to change the day, while others seek scriptural justification. But the facts are evident to any who are willing to look at the question with an open and honest mind. In addition to the weekly Sabbath, the Bible lists annual holy days and festivals. When Sandy Koufax fasted on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he was observing one of them. He was keeping it because it is commanded in the Scriptures. But some Christians also keep this day because the biblical record shows that Christ, His apostles, and the early church observed the seventh-day Sabbath and kept seven annual holy days and festivals. It's equally clear that Christianity today does not. Why? Why do the so-called Christian churches not follow the example set by Jesus Christ? 
I'll be back with the answer to this vitally important question in a minute. But I want to give you another chance to order your absolutely free copy of The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. It's not an exaggeration to say that it is impossible to fully understand God's plan for mankind without understanding these biblical holy days. The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, gives the big picture of what God is doing here below. It answers questions that may have eluded you your whole life. You need this information, so order your free copy of The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. There's no cost, no obligation, and no follow-up. Today's offer is yours absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. Call now, 1-800-236-0531. Or write to us at the address on your screen. Or visit us online at tomorrowsworld.org. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. And be sure to go to tomorrowsworld.org forward slash digital. Have a digital subscription sent right to your email inbox faster than postal mail. Visit us online now. Why do the so-called Christian churches not follow the example set by Jesus Christ, His apostles, and the early church? The New Testament shows us that they kept seven annual festivals in addition to the seventh-day Sabbath. They met together on these days and marked time by them. Here they are with a few of their New Testament references. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Last Great Day. Why do these sound strange to many years? Well, pagan names don't. For example, do you realize that the name Easter comes from the worship of Ishtra, the pagan goddess of fertility. And the celebration is accompanied by fertility symbols such as eggs, rabbits, and the Easter lily. Do you realize that Christmas is a celebration of the birth of the sun god Mithra? Now, I don't know about you, but it seems strange to me that pagan customs, which are nowhere found in the Bible, are blended through and through and what are considered to be the most important days in the Christian calendar, while the days Jesus kept are totally ignored. This is especially strange when the Bible commands that this is exactly what we are not to do. In Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 30, God instructed Israel not to ask, How did these nations serve their gods? and say, I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which He hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. While we read nowhere in the Scripture of such observances as Christmas or Easter, we do read that Christ and His apostles observed Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, and four additional biblical festivals. Now, don't take my word for it. Don't believe it because I say so. Read it out of your own Bible. Prove it for yourself. And to help you find these references, be sure to order your free copy of our resource, The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. The Apostle John makes this unambiguous statement regarding God's law and following Christ's example. 1 John 2 Verses 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk, just as He walked. The New Testament record is clear. Jesus kept such days as Passover, unleavened bread, and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Apostle Paul commanded the Corinthians to observe Passover 
and unleavened bread. Luke was a companion of Paul, and he marks time on Paul's journey by the Day of Atonement. Here we read of it in Acts the 27th chapter and verse 9. Now when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Virtually all authorities admit this is a reference to the Day of Atonement. And such a reference would be meaningless unless Luke's audience was familiar with when this day is found on the calendar. Now for those who have to hear the rest of the story, Don Drysdale started the 1965 World Series while Koufax fasted. The Dodgers lost that game 7 to nothing. Koufax pitched the next day and lost 1 to nothing. Down two games to none, the Dodgers came back to win their next three with Koufax pitching a complete game shutout in Game 5. Minnesota won Game 6 to tie the series at three games apiece. Then Dodger manager Walter Alston took a tremendous gamble. He called on Sandy Koufax to pitch the final game with only two days rest. Ball two, strike two, two out. Chillibrew on first. Dodgers leading two to nothing. He did it. Sandy Koufax gets his tenth strikeout, his second consecutive shutout of the Twins. Koufax went on to pitch a three-hit shutout, his second complete game shutout in four days. What Koufax did more than five decades ago was to bring to the attention of a nation the fact that there are some things more important than baseball, or any other game for that matter. As a Jew, he recognized that this day is like no other day in the year. But without the New Testament, he could never fully understand the meaning and the significance of this day. But you can. The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, takes you through the New Testament and shows you that these special days were kept by Jesus, his apostles, and the early church. It explains that they are relevant to you and me today and answers some of the most important questions that may have plagued you all of your life. So be sure to call, click, or write for your free copy of The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. And be sure to come back next week at the same time and station where Richard Ames, Wallace Smith, and I, as well as guest presenter Rod McNair, will bring you more good news of tomorrow's world. See you next time. To take advantage of today's free offer or view today's program now or anytime, go to tomorrowsworld.org. Find us on Facebook, watch us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.